And bearing in mind that for any future rule changes to the Premier League, you need 14 yes votes. And we've already got four no votes consistently now and potentially another one in Everton. Then all you need is two more. Two more teams to fall the side of Manchester City and Chelsea and Newcastle's thinking. And you have a scenario where PSR and FFP, the loopholes will never be closed. The tightening will never be able to be implemented. And in a nutshell, that results in a worthless system that we've all been working towards for the last 12 years. In that scenario, to me, it seems like a logical incrementalism towards the degradation of the Premier League and movement towards the Super League, which is what a lot of people with a lot of deep pockets want. FFP and PSR, two acronyms that I think we're all a little bit sick and tired of hearing about over the last few months. A lot of expectations this summer, a lot of time spent spoken by myself around the potential ramifications of overspend of a few teams in the Premier League that always seem to find a way, in the case of the bigger boys at least, to get away with alleged rampant overspending and alleged flagrant, if not breaking of the rules, then bending them, circumventing them, finding loopholes, and fair play to them. It's not for them to have to figure out and abide by laws that weren't written uh, uh, with a watertight element. They are doing what's in the best interest of their club. My anger is at the Premier League for their incompetence and their incapacity to be a little bit better at clarifying what you can and can't do. Over the last few weeks, guys, there's been a rush, or the last few days, there's been a rush of transfer activity from and between four of the six clubs that were supposed to be facing FFP and PSR deadline issues. They were in jeopardy and they had to sell before they could buy. That was the stories that we've been told that is the story we've all been looking forward to seeing a lot of premier league clubs have based some of their early transfer market interest on the assumption that some of these clubs may have to sell some of their bigger name players at a discount in order to get the right side i'm talking about you arsenal who thought you could get bruno gimares or alex isaac on the cheap i'm talking about you tottenham who thought conor gallagher was the answer. He was never the answer anyway, but thinking that you could manipulate and take advantage of the leverage that you thought you had over Chelsea has proven to be an embarrassing misstep. What about the likes of Manchester United putting in a derisory £35 million bid for Jared Branthwaite with £8 million in add-ons for one of the top up-and-coming young English left-footed, left-sided centre-backs in the game all because they thought that these clubs had to sell. but And they did. They did have to sell. But what we didn't think about was that they would be selling to each other, selling youth players that some of them make sense, some of the stories are justified, others definitely aren't. The valuations, generally speaking, are well above what you would think they are. We're going to talk about it all right now, not just the detail of those four teams, but, but what it means for FFP and PSL going forward, what it might mean for the inevitable, logically incremental movement towards a Super League if the three or four teams that are currently rejecting and resenting every amendment to the rules that tighten or propose to tighten around PSR and FFP can manage to convince teams like Everton or maybe Nottingham Forest or Leicester to join them, then they will have enough of a minority to be able to reject any future tightening of the rules which essentially makes PSR and FFP in the Premier League null and void, and at which point it becomes a race to the bottom for who has the deepest pockets. And I can tell you right now, it's not going to be my team, and it won't be about 12 or 13 others, but Newcastle, Aston Villa, Manchester City and Chelsea certainly wouldn't mind a scenario where ambition and deep pockets are all you need, and the law's are generally speaking made to be broken. Let's start with the story, guys. Guys, if you're enjoying this video and you're new around here, this is Sean Butler TV where we do talk all about football finance and things that are happening in the business side of sport. So if you enjoy that sort of stuff, if you're interested in the business side of football, then please hit the like button, hit, consider subscribing as well. 
And if you're just here because you know just me from Tottenham, then you can still go over to the Spurs talk show where I do my Tottenham daily videos for you. Love you guys. As with the rest of the Premier League, the four clubs need to submit their accounts by the end of the month and were all at risk of breaching PSR regulations, which allows losses of £105 million over a three-year period if they didn't sell players. Rather neatly, in what has been considered by some to be player laundering, they appear to, to be greasing each other's palms in a bid to avoid FFP sanctions. It's very rare in the Premier League do you see teams that are supposed to be competing with each other get together and almost on a quid pro quo basis, you scratch my back, I'll scratch, scratch yours, we can all get ourselves out of this predicament and then go again next year. And in so doing, maybe shake hands on future arrangements, as I just alluded to, regarding joining a retaliation, joining a revolt, a cartel that wants to um, impede any progress towards that competitive playing, uh, playing field that PSR and FFP were supposed to represent on paper. I know a lot of you that will watch this will be Newcastle fans or Aston Villa fans and will probably talk with your rose-tinted spectacles on and will talk your shop, just like you will accuse me of talking mine. People say that the top six clubs are a cartel, the big six are a cartel and want to protect competitive um, advantages that they have. I don't know why we call that a big six. Tottenham are clearly the sixth of that bracket of teams, but we're in no way, shape or form competing with them on trophies, on the things that really matter. Financially, we might be able to kind of have some argument to say we bridged the gap with Arsenal maybe and Chelsea over the last couple of years, but not because of deep pockets, not because of owners that have spent money that the club didn't generate. The only thing we have done is got a mortgage on a stadium, which you know I'm not entirely convinced why that is an argument to resent Tottenham. I think that Daniel Levy, and I'm talking to Tottenham fans here, Daniel Levy as a chairman has been incredibly um, prescient in his ability to see the world, the vision, the direction in which FFP, PSR, sustainability, financial fair play was moving and to try to prepare Tottenham to take us from a 36,000 seater stadium where we couldn't compete. And every time a new star emerged um, for us, like a Berbatov, a Carrick, a, a Modric, a Gareth Bale, every single time one of those emerged and they wanted to leave because Manchester United or Real Madrid came calling, we had to sell. I don't think we are that same sort of selling club anymore with the possible exception of Harry Kane, but that's not because of deep pockets, oil barons, sovereign wealth funds or any other shenanigans. It's because of our owner making decisions that are smart in regards to helping the club grow revenues whilst making ends meet. So the I understand maybe the, the, the top six or the big six cartel thing, if you're coming at it from a different perspective, but I don't really understand why Tottenham are thrown into that bucket. Let's get on with the story. I keep saying we're going to get on with the story. Lewis Dobbin moved from Everton to Aston Villa, while Tim Irugbunum, I'm not sure I'm, if I'm getting his name right there, Irugbunum uh, went the other way, both for around £9 million. Amari Kellerman is set to join Chelsea from Villa for a whopping £19 million, despite being valued, valued at less than £1 million on the back of two very brief Premier League substitute appearances after Unai Emery's side helped the Blues out with a £37.5 million deal for Ian Martin. The rules are quite simple. If you're selling players that are part of your youth uh, process club trained, then you don't have a purchase price that you are amortizing. They've come through the club. So when you sell, all of that money sits onto your accounts immediately. But when you buy someone, you get to amortize the cost over the length of their contract. And in the case of some of these, because they're young players, I'm sure those contracts are five years or even longer, um, which is something we're seeing again from Chelsea this particular summer. Not that they can amortize it over any more than five years, but you'll take the point. Talented Newcastle winger Yankuba Minte, I think his name is, has been heavily linked with, Ever with Everton, his supposed preferred destination. Under no duress, it must be said. On this particular one, I've seen Everton fans, or sorry, Newcastle fans saying that they're not on board selling this guy unless they have to, for whatever the reasons. If it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. But um, Minto is a player that they actually would like to keep um, after an impressive loan season with Feyenoord and that Newcastle were in talks with a move for Dominic Calvert-Lewin, who allegedly is desperate to get out of Goodison Park. Now, 
the particularly time the particular timing of those swap deals appears to be slightly off with both players attracting interest from Italy it doesn't matter where they go just as long as they do go in the next week in order to get those numbers correct now obviously the gamesmanship has begun this summer these are the majority of the deals that have been done nothing else of any meaningful note has taken place because of the euros and the copper america but these guys are very busy phoning each other up having a little chat figuring out the best way to maybe inflate these prices a little bit so that they can get around the fair market valuation rules. Although, again, I don't understand for the life of me how you can possibly judge, how an independent panel can judge what fair market valuations are on players when value is in the eye of the beholder to a football club. One club doesn't need a certain player because they have three already in that position. Another club is desperate for him. The valuation metrics can, can wildly differ. So I'm not entirely sure how uh, fair market value comes into player trading. It certainly is a thing when it comes to third-party um, uh, sponsorship deals, which we're going to come to in a second. But you do have to applaud the ingenuity of the smartest minds in the room when they're figuring out solutions that don't include selling your best players. In January, guys, the media was awash with suggestions of Newcastle for being forced to sell Bruno Gamarish and Alex Isaac. The same goes with, as I said, Jared Branthwaite, Conor Gallagher. The list could go on. Trevor Chalaber is another one. Whilst many teams naively believe they could leverage the clubs in trouble, they have been left disappointed and angry as the unified four have instead created a mini click. And quid pro quo dealings are the story of the week. As I said, Branthwaite received an insulting bid of £35 million, expecting Everton to panic. Did Manchester United absolutely insanely low? Tottenham spent all year debating the signing of Conor Gallagher. That one's not going to work out. That guy bleeds more blue than the royal family. Arsenal assumed a forced sale of Isaac was the final piece to their jigsaw, and now seemingly a pivoting to players at a much lower tier like Santiago Jimenez. Doesn't quite came, uh, come with the same gusto. But put simply, guys, the number paid and received for these youth team players are inflated to help one another out. As I've already said, full money received goes straight onto the accounts, but the other players that are sold are amortized. That's a rule I've never quite understood the need for, if I'm entirely honest. If you're trying to level the playing field between the super wealthy and the mere wealthy, if that was part of the plan, then all that has resulted is a pivot to gobble up all of the best young talent in the world at no FFP expense. And then these clubs like Manchester City and Chelsea that are brilliant at doing this will loan these players out to teams within their multi-club ownership model or to other teams with fees attached. They'll either sell them with clauses attached for additional sell-on fees in the future or they'll keep them and utilize them in their squad. All the time refilling the revenue that on paper has been placed as a profit on their FFP. It's incredibly clever. So all of these teams now are likely to be able to get to the right side of the line by the 1st of July as we enter the final year of traditional FFP, the Premier League rules, as they have been, the £105 million ruling, before we then pivot to the UEFA style, uh, that is squad, co uh, squad cost ratios that will be 70% by the 25-26 season. And again, I'm sure there'll be a million loopholes there that can be taken advantage of. The quartet of schemers are not breaking any rules. I've got to be honest here, guys. Like I say, I do not blame the teams. I think it's ingenious. I think it's very smart. I just think that the rule makers have been, they're always two steps behind. And I think that the uh, teams and, and clubs like Tottenham that have been preparing for a future where, where this was going to close the gap from the top down clearly have been naive in, in uh, not figuring out, not assuming that some of these guys are smart enough to figure out the gaping holes in the rules as they currently stand. Just quickly, guys, on Wednesday, I did speak about, I did a live stream on my other channel. In fact, they're not on this channel. Uh, I spoke of 10 loopholes within FFP. Three of them had already been exposed by Chelsea, the eight-year amortization law, the hotel uh, trading um, infrastructure between sister businesses and then loaning them back and leasing the revenue back to the original company um, alongside potentially, I'm not sure if you'll consider this a loophole, but um, utilizing the relationship they have with Clear Lake Capital and the fact that the PIF fund are an investor in Clear Lake Capital. Not, 
I think I've made the mistake before in saying that they're the biggest investor in Clear Lake. They're not, but they are still uh, in bed with Clear Lake to the tune of several billion dollars. And so, like I say, there is a scenario where you could argue what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Todd Bowley goes over to Saudi Arabia, has a quick conversation, comes back, and a week later, was it three, maybe four players left Chelsea last summer? Um, again, at inflated prices to to Saudi Arabia um, to, to, to take advantage of, of them. Within that list of 10, though, seven of them were suggestions that took me, just me, five minutes to imagine. I'm certain that the accountants of these clubs and the, law, and the, the lawyers, the attorneys, will be able to look through the rules and have hundreds of these loopholes up their sleeves. I'll give you a couple of other examples just to um, preempt it, like what happened on Wednesday. Put the video out on Wednesday. By Friday, one of those rules was broken. We talked about two clubs selling players to um, among themselves at inflated prices to amortize one and receive full cost on the other. Another one, intermediaries and agents fees, which is more of a, of a bigger deal for the future FFP, the UEFA similar system, the squad cost ratios. Um, what's to say a team doesn't simply request a quid pro quo on one deal where the cost of the fees was prohibitive and instead promised a double payment at a later date? Since when are agents fees or lawyers fees ever standardized anyway? They are on a per hour basis and are benchmarked. They are lawyers after all, especially when you hire third party intermediaries. It wouldn't surprise me whatsoever to see in the scenario where teams are a few million over or a few million under um, the, the threshold to maybe speak to some of their uh, cooperatives in the agents world and just say, look, can't pay you on this one, but we'll get you twice on the next one because it makes a difference. As it stands, there's no rule to saying you can't do that. As far as I'm aware, the loophole still exists. Or the idea of fair market value when it comes to sponsorship deals. This one is already in place. The Etihad uh, no longer can do what they did years ago where they essentially sponsor everything about Manchester City at very, very inflated prices. And the Premier League investigated it and saw that they were abnormally high. And so put in a rule saying that there's you have to justify it. You have to be able to, um, especially when it or in, in the world where it's coming from companies that have third party relationships to your owner, then you have to be able to justify it and make sure that that doesn't happen in the future, which is fine, makes loads of sense. But what's to stop a team like uh, Manchester City using the Abu Dhabi network and relationships to just get another company that has nothing to do with anything to do with the Abu Dhabi group that happens to be a partner, a supplier, an endorser, a friend of one of the other tentacles of industries in which the Abu Dhabi group walks into and says, hey, can you please do a sponsorship deal at a certain price? We can justify that. And don't worry, I'll get you back the other side via a party, via one of the businesses that are not subject to be audited by the Premier League because they're nothing to do with football. They just happen to also be a part of the Abu Dhabi group. This, to me, is, again, just two examples of very clear and obvious loopholes that, as I understand it, are still open to be manipulated. And consequently, you have to sit there and think, there's hundreds and hundreds of others that can be taken advantage of. And the point here is that the rules are not and never will be watertight. And the worst part about this, guys, for me, is that the usual click of teams that reject the suggested amendments towards tightening FFP and PSR rules in Newcastle, Manchester City and Chelsea, and you can understand why they have those ambitions and deep pockets and they would rather the rules go away. Well, all of a sudden, they have been joined by Aston Villa, who also have a very rich owner, I think the wealthiest man in Egypt. But that in and of itself probably wasn't enough to convince me that there wasn't something else going on. And what's happened this week has suggested to me that there are conversations happening, maybe little bubbles of clicks that are taking place within the Premier League. And seeing as how Everton have been a beneficiary this week of the trades between these clubs, then maybe at the next general vote, the next AGM where they get together and talk about amendments, then maybe Everton will join them in abstaining or rejecting. And bearing in mind that for any future rule changes to the Premier League, you need 14 yes votes. 
and we've already got four no votes consistently now and potentially another one in Everton, then all you need is two more. Two more teams to fall the side of Manchester City and Chelsea and Newcastle's thinking and you have a scenario where PSR and FFP, the loopholes will never be closed. The tightening will never be able to be implemented. And in a nutshell, that results in a worthless system that we've all been working towards for the last 12 years. In that scenario, to me, it seems like a logical incrementalism towards the degradation of the Premier League and movement towards the Super League, which is what a lot of people with a lot of deep pockets want. And you might say, well, who are the other two teams going to be? Well, maybe Leicester. They're already facing FFP breaches and charges that they have to face the consequences of just as they arrive into the Premier League. What about Nottingham Forest? They're a team that looked like they might also be struggling, and yet they haven't participated in this uh, four-way merry-go-round of loan players or young players moving, uh, moving home. Only takes a couple of conversations to convince them to join it, and all of a sudden, FFP is on its ass. If not those two, all it takes is a couple more venture capital or sovereign buyouts of two teams in the Premier League, maybe a Crystal Palace, maybe a West Ham, maybe a Southampton. All it takes is a buyout or two, and then those guys will also want the same thing. And like I say, in that scenario, it's no longer going to be competitive. It's only going to be you're going to see a couple more teams join the ranks of those that maybe can, on a random rare day, compete with Manchester City, whose success, by the way, is not formed only in their ability to spend. It's also in their ability to form an absolute tight-knit network of multi-club ownership where the maximum benefits of a multi-club ownership model are being witnessed day in, day out. It doesn't increase competition. It will have a two-tier split system where the 12 teams at the bottom will never be able to compete unless they are bought out by themselves or bought out themselves, in which case now we're just a plaything of the super wealthy. And that, to me, undermines the entire purpose of the Premier League. As I say, guys, for, for those of you that are watching this that are going to say I'm a Tottenham fan and I'm trying to protect the big six thing, I'm really not because I don't see Tottenham as part of the big six. I see Tottenham as far closer to Aston Villa and Newcastle, both on trophy on historical success over the last 75 years. Wolves, Leicester, Leeds, those sorts of teams. We're in that bucket. And then you have the big five that win 85% of all trophies that can be won. And two of those teams only came into the party in 2002 and 2012. So it's really not Tottenham. Tottenham shouldn't be your focal point here. If anything, Tottenham is a demonstration of a long, patient process that can provide you with an opportunity to compete without needing the deep pockets. But I still make the argument that we are nowhere near competitive enough. Anyway, that's your update. That's the explanation. Like, subscribe and comment, guys, if you